Some of you might have been a little bit confused, especially online, for the opening anthem when I introduced the song and I stayed on uh, to join in song. Uh, obviously, uh, I am not John. And uh, John had, um, he had a little bit of, um, he, he fell ill. And fortunately, we, we have backup, me. And I was able to uh, lead the congregation in song today. So we lift up prayers of healing and prayers of blessing for our dear brother, our music leader, John Palompo, on this morning. I want to open up with a special, uh, it's, a, it's a Father's Day prayer that I found, and it, it got my attention mainly because when I saw it initially, uh, it, there was a good mixture of good-natured humor, but also so much truth packed into this prayer. The prayer was written by a man named Pete Gregg, who is a church leader in the UK. He founded a movement almost 20 years ago called the 24-7 Prayer Movement, which is exactly what it sounds like. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, nonstop, unceasing prayer being lifted up to the Lord. And he's associated, affiliated with the Church of England, and he has prayers of renewal and revival within the UK. So, so many good things are coming out of, uh, out of Great Britain, and, and he, uh, he is someone I admire. I've listened to him at various conferences. I follow him on social media, and, re- and he lifted up this prayer. So I want to read it for you as our opening Father's Day prayer. We pray today for all dads, new dads, granddads, stepdads, adoptive dads, solo dads, baldy ones, beardy ones, skinny ones, and cuddly ones, dads who tell bad jokes, dads who dance to YMCA, dads who know how to fix things, and dads who just pretend. Father to the fatherless, we pray for those for whom this day is sadder than it is happy, those who feel that they have failed, those who are grieving children they never had, those missing their dads or their children even more than usual. Father of mercy, for all those poor people everywhere who forgot Father's Day, we ask that you would bless them in your abundant grace and manifold mercy with well-stocked convenience stores. Father of comfort, heal our many hurts, Restore the dignity, strength, and integrity of fatherhood in our nation and world. I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, and I pray that all of us may know the love of Christ. O Father God, in a world where some dads are distant, absent, or even abusive, we lean into your everlasting love. You are ever-present and faithful, especially to those of us orphaned, abandoned, and hurt. Come, Lord, this day. Bless us all. In Jesus' name, amen. As we go into the scriptures today, I want to start with a few obvious statements of fact, having nothing to do with the, this story. But basically, if your car is giving you trouble, you go to a mechanic. If you are in a legal bind, you ask around for the best possible attorney. If you're sick, you go to your physician. That's logical and it makes sense. But what about this next one? If you're out at sea and you're rocked by a fierce tempest, where do you go? Well, according to the gospel story, you go to Jesus. But if we follow the logic of my previous statements, um, yeah, prayer is good. But I feel like the first person you would look for 
is a sailor, a captain, an experienced seaman who has been through the storms of life or the storms of the raging sea. Wouldn't you go to that person instead? And you see this boat filled with 12 men called disciples and Jesus. The scene is there's a storm raging. There are 12 men. Jesus is sleeping. And out of the 12 men, a good deal of them are experienced fishermen. In fact, they grew up on these very shores and they grew up fishing this very sea, right? Who were the first disciples that Jesus called? The two sets of brothers, Simon and Andrew, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They spent all their lives in the Sea of Galilee and here they are in a storm. They get scared and they turn to Jesus. Now, if I'm the other disciples, I'm looking at them going, what? You're the expert here. Fix this. Guide us. Navigate us to the other side. What are you doing talking to Jesus? I mean, he's Lord and rabbi, but he's the carpenter's son. Why would you go to him? At least that was my initial reaction upon reading this is, why would you not go to the experts? Instead, why would you go to Jesus? But nevertheless, they scrambled around looking for Jesus, begging him to do something. But I want to bring us to this point. It's not just the 12 who are in trouble. What do I mean by that? This leads me to my first point. First, we must look outside the boat. Look outside the boat. If you go back to verse 36, there is this short parenthetical reference that's just kind of thrown in there, almost as an afterthought, but it's critical. That parenthetical remark is, although other boats followed. So we see here that Jesus, the twelve, and their solo boat was not the only ones at sea that evening there were other people with them there were other boats with them when the disciples asked Jesus to save them Jesus responded he calmed the waters and that miracle benefited not only the the passengers of Jesus' boat that miracle aided all those who were around. Now, who occupied these other boats? Does it really matter? They were people, maybe even children. My guess is this. They were a mix of curious seekers. They were captivated by the teachings of Jesus. They wanted to see signs of heaven, the signs and wonders that Jesus was displaying and demonstrating all throughout the region of Galilee. So there's that group, right? You could call them the, the Jesus groupies, and they're just following Jesus every step he takes. They're following. But I also think there might have been a group of women disciples. Wow, Pastor Sam, where would you get that? How could you extrapolate that from one parenthetical reference? Well, in Luke's gospel, we get the same story. Jesus, other side of the lake, storm, calmed, and they reach the other shore. But right before that incident, Luke offers this remark in Luke chapter 8. In the 8th chapter of Luke, Luke mentions those who were gathered around Jesus alongside the twelve. And he writes, also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, people like Mary, also called Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was among the group that followed Jesus everywhere. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna, along with many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own financial means. Now that's another kind of little offhanded remark that if we're not careful in listening to the Word of God, we'll gloss over. 
If you catch that in Luke chapter 8, verse 3, you will discover that the financial supporters of Jesus' ministry and mission were women. That is mind-blowing. That these women disciples were the ones paying the way, paving the way, enabling Jesus to do his ministry unencumbered by the needs of material things and food and shelter and what have you. Thanks be to God. But I think maybe in my, in my uh, imagination, I like to think that they were among and others followed along. I think they were in other boats as well. And Jesus saved them. And so if we could just look outside the boat that the disciples were traveling in, the lesson is clear. Jesus not only saves his disciples, Jesus saves so many others as well. And this leads me to my second point. Look outside the church. Just as the disciples need to look outside the boat, we today must look outside the church. Friends, there are others outside of this faith community trapped amidst the storms of life. What is the appropriate response of any follower of Jesus today? Uh, there are so many issues that I could cover. I want to I mention two that have been near and dear to my heart in, recent, in, in these times. The first group of people that I'm thinking about is actually they, are, they might be members of our church. But because of the year and a half long lockdown and pandemic, somehow, some way, they have fallen through the cracks and they are not here today, physically with us. Take a quick second and look around. Look around and make eye contact with your sisters and brothers, your siblings in Christ. My invitation is this. Notice, don't notice who's here. Don't just do that. Notice who isn't here. Who's, who's missing? And who is not among us? Now, I'm not even talking about the folks that stay engaged through our live stream worship. But I mean, they, they haven't been able to log on to the live stream, and they haven't been in person yet. Who among us within our faith community is missing? Sisters and brothers, I believe it is very much our call as the family of Christ known as IAA UMC to look out for each other. This coming week, my humble invitation to you is this. Won't you consider giving a phone call? Or if you're of a younger generation or you're used to it, send out an email or a text message. How's it going? How are you? I'm just checking in. And looking around right now, there are some of you in this room, uh, you, are, you have been doing that from day one. And so I guess I'm preaching to the choir, so to speak, when you're listening to that word of encouragement. But for the rest of us, my hope and encouragement is, won't you consider picking up your phone, typing away a text message. If you're, if you're a neighbor, knock on their door. Hey, how's it? How are you? Good to see you. How goes it with your soul? Another group outside of the church that my heart has been on recently is in the, in the past year since I've been here, I've noticed that our church campus has, is a uh, safe hub for the houseless community among IAEA. Uh, what do I mean by that? that you know, I'm, I'm speaking in uh, subtleties here. Well, just to be frank, every evening on our church campus, we have many houseless peoples, mostly men sleeping around the perimeter of the campus. They find some nook or corner, some safe, dry place to lay their head down. And 
our leadership, our appointed leadership, we've been handling this crisis with, um, with two things in mind. On one hand, we must maintain the security and the safety of our campus and all of our staff, members, and guests who come to this campus. That is non-negotiable. We have to maintain a safe atmosphere, environment, for all who would come to this church, right? So by extension, we cannot allow, we cannot permit um, tent cities or anything like that to form. So on that end, the trustees have been so dutiful and faithful in brainstorming and thinking of ways to maintain the safety of our campus. And I, for the record, support that 100%. We need to continue to maintain. How do we keep our beautiful campus safe and secure? But there's another aspect of this question as we think about that point of looking outside the church which is a missional aspect. And that is, okay, Lord, obviously you are sending the sick, the homeless, those who are in poor conditions, literally to our doorstep. Like quite literally, they are here falling at our doorstep. Now what? Any... Any Christian, any follower of Jesus with integrity who reads the scriptures will know that the heart of Jesus is for those very people. And so God, how would you have AUMC express that heart of God, that heart of compassion and love and hospitality to those people? How? And that's more of an ad council and missions committee, ministry focused question that we as servants must ask. But the fact remains, both of those are held in balance. They're held in this beautiful tension that we as a church have as we move forward. And I invite all of you to pray with us. Lord God, help us on both ends, that our campus that God has blessed us with, that we have been doing mission and ministry here in Aea for over a century. God, Won't you keep this campus safe and secure and help us to maintain it as such? But at the same time, God, won't you help us to be the hands and feet of Jesus? I would like to be your hands and feet, Lord Jesus. If people are coming to my doorstep, rather than simply, callously, um, coldly shooing them away, give me ideas, God, because I don't know. I don't know what to do. And instead of passing the buck, instead of saying this is a state issue, instead of saying this this should be city and county or HPD or mental health dealing with it, in some cases it is, in some cases it very much is, but for the other instances where they're harmless and they're simply looking for a place to lay their head down and maybe they're hungry, maybe they're thirsty, well, what would you have me do? Now, this, this incident didn't appear over the past year. It's been ongoing. It's been going on for years now, decades even. But the feeling is this, that COVID-19 and the pandemic, the lockdown, the economic turn, downturn, the ending of the eviction moratorium, all of that is going to compound and accelerate the houseless issue in our community. So what shall we do? And lastly, my last point is this. Uh, We look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Look, so look outside the boat, look outside the church, but obviously, and maybe this should have been my first point because this is the obvious and most important point, look to Jesus. That's what the disciples did, right? They didn't turn to each other as experienced sailors. What do we do in a storm? Uh, They looked to Jesus. Now, remember what preceded the storm, I have this quote here. Jesus said, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So Jesus knew his destination. He knew where he wanted to go, and he was leading his disciples. And isn't that an apt metaphor of our discipleship even today? 
for us as disciples, we look to Jesus. What would you have me do? Where would you have me go? What would you have me say? And we look to Jesus, and Jesus guides our lives. That's what it means to be a disciple. Now, in the case of this story, Jesus told his followers, we're getting to that other side because I have something to do there. Friends, Jesus keeps his promises. If Jesus says, we're getting to the other side, we're getting to the other side. Sometimes in the midst of storms of life, we forget this. But we, we, have, we have to acknowledge that the storms of life are inevitable. In fact, this is true. When we decide to become disciples of Jesus and we follow Christ, oftentimes that is the precursor, that is the catalyst for storms of life to come upon us. When we say, I will follow you, Jesus. I will do your will. That is the very decision that precipitates storms of life for many of us. It's what we do when the storms of life hit that make all the difference. Will we look to Jesus? Will we focus our eyes on Jesus? Jesus assured his disciples that their destination was the other side, as opposed to the bottom of the lake. Jesus said, we're getting there. And so as we walk this path of discipleship today, as we brainstorm and do that homework together of look outside the church, Collectively, as the family of AUMC, as we wrestle with that question and looking outside the church, let us trust in Jesus, that Jesus will inspire and guide and speak to us exactly what we are called to do in this time and place. Even on this Father's Day, may this be a reminder for those of us dads who follow Christ, that we are invited by Jesus to look unto Christ to look and fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. In many ways, this is the example that we set for our families. This is the example that we set for our church. Friends, siblings in Christ, let us all look to Jesus, even in the midst of all of life's storms. Let us pray. God, I know that it's easier said than done to uh, look outside the boat, look outside the church, look to Jesus. Uh, Those are nice uh, sound bites. But when we attempt to practice them in our everyday lives, uh, that's where the challenges rise up. And so we humbly ask for the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. Fill us so that we would know of your peace that we would know of your grace so that even in the storms of life uh, our hearts and minds would not be frazzled Uh, we would not shake in fear but instead we would remain standing still deep within the promises of God Uh, We thank you so much and we love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.